All right, church, can you hear me? Maybe. Check, check. Check, check. I've been wrestling mics a lot today. Thanks for bearing with us. There we are. I think you can hear me now, can't you? Give me a thumbs up or just a confused look if you can't hear me. All right. All right. Well, church, um, got some housekeeping things, some exciting housekeeping things to do here before we jump into the word this morning. Um, one of those things is, if you see here, we, we removed the plaques from the pews that we removed last week, and as you're sitting in these comfy chairs, but we also wanted to remember the saints that had come before us that had blessed us with those for, I think, over 50 years. 50 or 60 years, if my recollection. And so we're gonna put together a plaque. We're gonna take a piece of wood and, and we're gonna put all of these plaques together so that we honor the saints that have come before us. But with the remembrance comes a challenge. You know how the saints that have come before us have set us up and helped us through in our relationship with Jesus for many years as a church? That's our role, that's our duty for the next generations. Church, can we do that in honor of them and in honor of their memory? Um, so if you want to, maybe after church, you can come up and see some of the names that were put on those pews. Secondly, um, pretty cool, we as a church have a gold claim. Um, and so one of those cool things is it means once a year we get to go and we get to pan for gold. That sounds kind of cool. Anybody ever done that? I've never done that. This will be my first year. And so we're going to go as a church and pan for gold on Saturday. Um, and so if you want to be a part of that on Saturday, talk to Randy. Randy, you want to raise your hand? Or myself. Um, and we will get you in on that. I'm excited. Um, I kind of jokingly said it's a, it's a really good illustration of what we do in ministry when we pan for gold. We're looking for the gold that God has put in people. That's their gifting, right? And so there's kind of this cool sense that we get to practice that physically and spiritually as a church. And then uh, lastly, this week, I know it's a busy week. If you're not taking notes, you might forget some of the things we've announced so far, so make sure you write some of this stuff down. We have my good friends, the Ericsons, are coming, and they're missionaries in Senegal, and uh, they're going to share their story, but I want to give you just a, a quick um, prelude. So they put together this video. Um, so Senegal is a predominantly Muslim country, and Muslims, I don't know if you've read in the news or saw that Muslims don't, Muslim countries in particular, do not respond well to what? Christians, right? Or respond well to uh, Christianity. And so they're there sharing the gospel and they're there um, training people up. And uh, so I want to just share this video with you a little bit about some of their struggles and their time in Senegal. And they will be here, actually, before I press play, they will be here this Wednesday. We're going to have a campfire over at my house, at the Parsonage, and so we want to invite you to come to see their presentation and then come have s'mores with us afterwards and meet them and their family, okay? Um, so, without further ado, here is the Ericsons. Can we turn the audio up pretty high there? I was sent to the Dara when I was uh, six years old. My parents uh, sent me to the Dara. The tally-based system is a dark cycle. Boys are sent from their families, many from other nations, to the Quranic schools in Senegal called Daras. Many of these boys are as young as five years old. They begin their lessons in the morning, usually while it is still dark out, reciting the Quran by force over and over. And if the recitation is not satisfactory, they are often beaten or whipped. In most situations, it is the boy's duty in the Dara to financially support their serene in exchange for the teaching of the Quran. Sometimes in order to support an affluent life and feed his multiple wives and his many children, all of this is on the backs of desolate young boys who spend their days in the streets and often go years without seeing their parents. This life is seen as a sacrifice to Allah to bring blessing upon their families and as a means to create resiliency and toughness in the children. It certainly accomplishes the latter, but at what cost? Uh, the Syrian was beating me, he was beating me till he get tired and he was like, I don't know exactly, he was 
if he was about to kill me or not. But he lifted me high and beat me against the uh, the cement. So what can be done? Admittedly, it often feels like our best efforts are nothing more than a drop in the ocean. Ultimately, only the gospel can melt the hearts of a culture that is proud of its religion and its traditions. Only the Holy Spirit can bring transformation to a people that are so resistant to change. Only Jesus can save these straying souls. In the waiting for God to bring a fresh rain to this dry and weary land, we put our hands to the plow, we plant seeds, we prepare the fields for the coming rain. We cannot help all, but we can help some. We cannot bring the gospel to all, but we can bring the gospel to some. Pretty amazing, isn't it, that we were blessed enough to um, be raised in a, in a country where we weren't forced to read the Koran every day, and that we had access to God's Word, which, if you see the contrast there, what does God's Word do? It's, it sets us free. The truth sets us free, right? And so, hey, I, I just want to encourage you, church, if you would, come and join us Wednesday night, Campfire, Josh and Heather, his wife, and their kids are good, close friends of ours. And so um, we're, they're coming through. They partner with the Alliance Church here. And um, they're excited to come and share a little bit about what they're doing. All right. That was a lot. You guys doing okay? Okay, I checked that a lot. I, mean, I just want to make sure when I ask, are you doing okay, if you give me a shake of the head... It lets me know that you're still with us, okay? So we're going to, we've been going through a series about the church and what is it, our role as the church here in First Baptist Church, in Riverton in particular. God has called each one of us to be here at this time in this community, and so what is God's call on us in this community in this time? And so the Bible uh, lays out how a church should function. What should we be about? So we spent several weeks on scripture. That's S. We're calling it SCOPE is an acronym that's helping us remember what the church is supposed to be about. So S stands for scripture. And we've spent three weeks. And remember, the big charge there is if we become a church that every single person knows the word of God, believes the word of God, and knows how to further their learning in the word of God, we can see incredible things happen, can't we? Well, today we want to open up with community, with community. We're going to be talking about community. And God has Saved many, those of us who are saved or have professed faith in Jesus, who are believers, we're saved from sin, but we're saved to something. We're saved to something. We become a part of the family of God. This is called the church. The church. And so we're called to become a part of a community. Um, many of you here in the next few days, or uh, maybe you have already, um, have had campfires, yes? Anybody have a campfire already? We've gotten our campfire pit out. I actually stole ours from our backyard just so I could show you how. Um, I love, love, love campfires. And the reason I love, love, love campfires is because they tend to bring people together. You get a fire started. In fact, where's my lighter here? Let me see if I, should I light a campfire in the auditorium? Would that be a little crazy? I'm just kidding. Elders, don't worry. <laughs> I saw Ozzy just about get ready to run up and, and like take the lighter from me. So, <laughs> But no, I love campfires because they have this tendency to bring us together because in the darkness and in the cold, there's warmth and there's light, yes, in a campfire. And so, man, and there's s'mores. Let's just be honest. Who wouldn't surround a campfire for s'mores? But the thing about campfires is they're a lot like how the church is supposed to be. All of us are to be running towards Christ for the warmth and the light that Christ provides. And what does that do? It brings us all around him. And you ever notice 
There's this funny thing that when you're pursuing Christ and you look around and you see other pursue, others following and pursuing Christ, that there's a unity and there's a fellowship and there's a community there at the feet of Christ like none other in this world. That's the kind of community that Christ produces. And so we wanna be a campfire church. I love that. Can we be a church so focused on Jesus as the centerpiece of our church that it brings us together no matter what background we come from, no matter what culture we come from, whether it's Senegal or whether it's from Riverton, Wyoming, we can all come together for the warmth and the light of Christ so let's talk about then what is the church. And so we want to be a community or the church. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. And we're going to come to a familiar passage. We read this same account in the book of Mark not but a few weeks ago. And as you're turning there, I want to define for you the word church because we have a really messed up understanding today about what the church is. Is this building the church? No. Oh, good. I don't have to preach this sermon then, right? <laughs> but when we say, hey, we're going to church, we're saying, hey, what is the church? It's, you ever done, it's the people, right? It's the people. It's the people, but not just the people. Because if you get a big bunch of people together, is that a church? I've seen a lot of rock concerts that have a lot of people. That's not the church. So what is the church? The word literally, if you want to say it like how it was written, it's called ecclesia. Ecclesia is the word church. And it means the followers of Christ who derived their identity and mission from Jesus and understand themselves to be the true eschatological community of God eschatological community of God. That's a big word just to say that the, in the last days, it's the last community of God, those who are the followers of Jesus. So there's this sense that the church is a group of people that are absolutely devoted and obsessed with Jesus. I, I think I've shared with you, that's the origin of the term Christian. Did you know that? It was originally an insult in Antioch. When people called the early believers Christians, they were saying, you bunch of little Christs, because all they could talk about was Jesus. All they could think about was Jesus. All they could gather together for was Jesus. When they broke bread, it was about Jesus. And so there was this sense that they were called Christians. And so that's the church. When we come together as a devotion to Christ, we find ourselves becoming the church. And the word church actually in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is only mentioned twice, both in Matthew. And here is one of the passages where church is mentioned. I'm going to read it for you. Matthew 16, verses 15 through 18 says this. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? You guys remember this conversation with Peter? It's happening in Caesarea of Philippi, which is a really nasty town. It's like the Las Vegas of the old, old, old world. And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So here, excuse me, Jesus is saying that this is a miraculous truth. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my What's that word? Church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this is an incredible promise of Jesus is that, that when we gather as the church and the church that Jesus is building is so powerful that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We need to understand my, my uh, a good friend of mine and mentor who's coming next weekend, John Kraft, always reminded me, our gates... Uh, gates defensive or are they offensive? They're defensive. So if these are the gates of hell, then they're trying to protect what? What is that, that which is hell's, right? And it's our job as the church, the church that Jesus is building, do you get this? 
to raid the gates of hell, that they shall not prevail. What does that mean? That means when we share the gospel, we take the things that were meant for hell, for darkness, for separation from God, and we bring them into what? The, the kingdom of Christ, into life. And so there's this sense then that the church that Jesus is building has the power that the gates of hell themselves will not prevail against it. That's good news for us, isn't it, church? Because it's really easy to feel like the church has been defeated today. Anybody feel like that sometimes? It's because you're listening to the wrong voice. Of course, the world wants to tell you the church is defeated. It doesn't want word to get out that the church is powerful because it's centered on Jesus it says, and on this rock I will build my church. Um, Catholics typically take this verse then to say that, that this, is the, this is Jesus handing the keys of the church to, to Peter himself that would be the first pope. Of course, we know that uh, a better interpretation of that because G it, nowhere does it say you need to hand the keys to somewhere else or to someone else after you, Peter. The important thing that Jesus is building his church around is what in this passage? Can you see it? What did Peter just say? You are the Christ. So God's church is to be built around the confession that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus is the Messiah. That he is the centerpiece of all history and that he is our Lord and he is our Savior. And so the, for us today, we need to understand that the church, what is the church? It is the followers of Jesus everywhere, always. And the church is always centered around lordship and confession of Jesus. That is what Jesus builds his church upon. It's centered around the confession of who Jesus is, centered around Jesus. So if a group of people, even though they call themselves Christians, stop gathering around Jesus are they still a church? The answer is no. If a group of believers start to gather for something else, that's called idolatry. And so if we come around and gather just based on like beliefs or, or like um, interests, and not about Jesus. We have to be really careful about this. A lot of churches become these things called country clubs where we like the same things, we like the same music, so we like to gather around another, one another because it's really easy. But then all of a sudden you find that the church starts to drift away from the teachings of Jesus and then it's, they're gathering no longer for the purpose of Jesus. Do you see this in the church today? If we gather around something else, we are not the church. I think a lot of churches gather around this idea of serving ourselves. In fact, I've even heard it this week. The church is supposed to feed me, pastor. Who's that about? I come to get what I need, pastor. Oh, that's, you're not here for the, to be centered on Jesus. You're, you're here to get what you need so that you can live a better life or so that you can be encouraged. You know, by the way, those things are, are um, they're kind of like additions to following Jesus. You get encouraged, you find support. But if those become the pursuit, if you're just here to feel good about yourself, you're gonna miss the one thing that can truly satisfy, which is Jesus alone. A lot of people have tried to force the church to, uh, to serve a political party one way or another. And so then they try to gather Christians around what they call, and this is, man, brothers and sisters, can I just say, this breaks my heart that our society has co-opted the word evangelism. And it's, so you, now it's a political means. Evangelicals are those to be politically manipulated for votes. And that breaks my heart because that's not the source of that word, evangelical. That means that we are to be gospel sharers. Evangelism, the source of that is to be a life giver or sharing the gospel of Jesus, not to be centered around a political party. I don't care what political party, it's to be about Jesus. What's divided the church over the last five or six years? Why was the church found so weak? 
Brothers and sisters, I think it's because we were gathering for the wrong reasons. That we weren't centered on the light and the warmth of Jesus, that we were there for our own reasons. And so as soon as those reasons got challenged, what happened? Everybody left. I stopped hearing the music that I wanted to hear. I stopped, it just didn't get as comfortable as I wanted it to be. It cannot, the church cannot be based on preference. We have to be centered on Jesus. Let me give you just a list. I came up with a list of how many different churches that are centered on just a specific interest or niche group. Are you ready? And I'm not saying these are bad churches, but I'm saying look how divided we are. We have, of course, the thousands of different denominations, amen? I don't have to list those. But we base churches on lifestyle, like we have motorcycle churches. We have cowboy churches. We have churches for those that are hurt by the church. We have charismatic churches. We have very reverent, fearful churches. We have full band churches and we have no drums churches. We have rock churches and we have organ churches. We have hymn only churches and we have teaching churches. We have free will churches and we have predestination churches. We have dress up church and then we have dress down church. We base our churches sometimes on background, on social, social economic status, on race. It amazes me still how much in the U.S. we still see black churches and we see white churches. We see Hispanic churches and we see native churches. And I think that's beautiful, but why do they have to be so separated? If we're centered on Jesus, we all leave our culture behind to pick up the things that Christ gives us. Jesus is not for the white man. Jesus is for everybody. And we're all called by Jesus to walk away from our inherited culture to walk into his heavenly culture. But it's so much easier, isn't it, to split up by age Young people, man, I, I hear it all the time. I, I want to see a bunch of young people. I want to be around young people in church, so I'm going to find a young people church. You want to find a lack of wisdom? Go to a young people church. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You want to go to an older generation's church? I'm just going to lay it out. You may find some missing fervor. Some missing fervor, huh? We need each other. Did you know Jesus designed the church to be like that? So gender, age, I got encouraged one time to start a collegiate church, and I thought about it for about two minutes, and I thought, if I had an elder board of just college students, we would be in trouble. <laughs> be living on top ramen. <laughs> We'd be preaching the gospel, man. I've seen it in some communities. There's just children's church, that they base an entire church just solely on children's ministry. Well, that's great. We want, to, we want the, the younger generations to hear the gospel, but they also need discipleship one-on-one -on -one with older saints because that's what Scripture tells us. Let the older men mentor the younger men and let the older women mentor the younger women. So what is the church? It's the followers of Jesus, really simply put, centered around Jesus. So how do we become the church? I just want to give you a few things for us to walk away with today. Real practical. How do we become the church? Well, it starts with sacrifice. And Jesus modeled this for us. We are centered around Jesus and what he did in history. He paid his life for the church, didn't he? He laid himself out for the church. Jesus sacrificed everything for us. And so there's this sense that when you become a part of the faith family, it means that we are willing to sacrifice, not just for one another, but because Jesus first sacrificed for us, that should lead us to wanting to make sacrifices for one another. Amen? 
This is why I warn people when they want to become members. Wait, did you know your pastor, when I sit down with people, and they're like, hey, I want to join the church, and I go, are you sure? Because sometimes there's this sense that if you're going to join this faith family, then we're going to live our best to be like Jesus. And sometimes that means you're going to have to sacrifice your preferences, your desires, sometimes your time. Sometimes it means that you're going to have to sacrifice and be uncomfortable with one another. Why do you do that? Because of the warmth and the light of Jesus Christ that brings us together. This is why the church is unique, right? Because the church is, is one of the few organizations that doesn't have to just cater to the preferences of everybody, but instead it, it seeks out the will of Jesus above all else. I want you to turn, uh, if you have your Bible, Matthew 16, 24 through 25 says, Matthew 16, 24 through 25. And then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This was our memory verse last month on purpose. You see that big word there is deny self. That, that sacrifice, isn't it? And let's just be honest, we as an American culture are really terrible at denying ourselves. Can I get an amen? <laughs> We're really bad at self-denial, but here Jesus' call to us is to deny self. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, uh, so this is Matthew 19. If you keep turning in Matthew, Matthew 19, verses 28 through 29 Matthew 19, verses 28 through 29 says, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Is there a sense of sacrifice? Yeah. But get this, did you read in there, there will, will receive a hundredfold. What's that hundredfold? You ever wondered about that in that verse? What's the hundredfold? If we walk away from these things, brothers, mothers, and children, for the sake of Christ... And I'm not advocating for that, and the scripture isn't, but it's just trying to put into uh, words the priority that, the, that Christ is supposed to have in our lives. We'll receive a hundredfold. That's the church. So when you enter into the church, if you've ever noticed the, the language that the Bible starts to use when you enter the church is what? Brothers, sisters. We become a family, don't we? We become a family. That's the, that's the type of wording used. And so there's a sense for everything that you sacrifice, you gain in the church. Did you know the church in this life is a part of that abundant life that Jesus promised you? You ever read that passage? I come to bring, give life and life abundantly. Part of that promise is the church. So today, and maybe this message is for everybody who's not here at church, But God's reward for you in this life and to prepare you in the next is the church. So that means sacrifice. It also means prioritize. We prioritize one another for the sake of Christ. John 13, 34 through 35 says, and this is the Monday, Thursday, this is the Monday, Thursday before he goes to the cross. John 13 tells us, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said that the world will know that you are my disciples by how you vote. Oh, what does it say there? By how you love one another. Church, 
Are we known? Are we known? Are we known by our love of one another so much so that people say they have to be obsessed with Jesus? A new commandment I give to you. And I think of all the least of these verses uh, in context, when we read what you do to the least of these you've done to me, in Scripture, the context there, he says, is my brothers and sisters. And so there's a sense in Scripture, every time you read the one another's or serving one another, in fact, literally visiting believers in prison, feeding them when they're hungry, clothing them when they are naked, the brother is supposed to be prioritized. The church, the brothers and sisters, the followers of Jesus are to be prioritized above everyone and everything else. How are we doing <laughs> I think there's a reason why the world looks at us and say, I don't see anything different about you, church. You're just another nonprofit organization. Oh, that hurts, doesn't it? Don't worry, I'm gonna get encouraging here soon, okay? It's coming. <clears throat> when we serve one another as if, uh, so when we serve the brothers or the sisters, we serve them as if they were Christ because his special presence is in the church. How you treat the church is how, I'm gonna say this, this is really important if you're taking notes. How you treat the church is how you treat Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I ask, hey man, how are you doing with Jesus? And people will tell me, oh man, I'm really great with him. I'm really good, I go up to the mountains all the time, but I really can't stand church. That would be like somebody walking up to me and being like, hey, Shane, I really like you, but your wife is the worst. <laughs> you know what I'm probably going to do? Somebody tells me that. I might take a chair and throw it at him. I don't know. <laughs> but there's this sense that how you treat the bride of Christ. See, Jesus literally in the scripture says, the church, the people of God are my bride. I love, I died for her. And then how many of us badmouth the church? Honor me, that's I think where you get passages in scripture that says you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far, far from me. Because in the economy of God, to do these things for our brothers and sisters is to literally do it for Christ. If you don't love the church, the followers of Jesus, then you cannot be the church. If you don't love the church, you cannot be the church because Jesus loved the church. If you mistreat or bad mouth, uh, like my wife, for example, I'm not going to be very happy with you. I wonder how many times Jesus says, that's my bride. That's my bride whom I died for. 1 John 4, 19 through 21 says, we love because he first loved us. We love, I'm going to say that again, because he first loved us. So if we have a hard time loving the people of God, is it because maybe we're not experiencing the love that God has for us? What do you think, church? I think our love problem doesn't just, isn't just a horizontal issue. I think it's a vertical issue. Because we are to be a people so impacted by the love of God that we feel it, that we know it, that we read it, that we live it out, that it affects our relationships horizontally. Because the vertical, the heavenly relationship always affects the earthly relationships, doesn't it? If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, this is not Pastor Shane. This is Jesus, okay? If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And, his com and this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. Did you hear their word, the commandment? By the way, is it easy just to love people? It's not simple, right? I've seen some of you driving around 
It's, it's, sometimes it's hard to love people when they're on the road or when you see them or when they make you uncomfortable. But there's this sense that it doesn't matter. When it comes to God's church, we choose to love them anyway because God chose to love us despite our sins. See, while we were still sinners, God sent his son for us. He didn't wait for us to clean our act up before he saved us, but instead, while we were still sinners. <clears throat> so with that, I'm just gonna introduce, in the interest of time, we're gonna spend the next two weeks on all of the, um, how do we say, prescriptions. You guys remember when we're reading the Bible, there's descriptions, there's description events or descriptive passages that are things that happen in history, and there's prescription in Scripture that says this is how you ought to live, okay? So we're gonna go through what are the prescriptions for the church, how are we supposed to be a community, and I'll give you a hint, there's over 55 of them. They're called the one another's, the one another's. And uh, I'm gonna introduce this next week, but just as a, as a prelude to us, there are over 55, 59 one another's in the New Testament. This church is particularly good at this. I wrote this in my notes just to remind me to say, hey, church, First Baptist, I'm blown away by the family that we have here and by what God is doing in and through us. The vertical relationship will always affect the horizontal relationships because we become like what we behold. And so the idea here is that when we look at the one another's, Jesus has done and accomplished every one of the one another's for us so that we might do them for one another. So you think about it like this. A relationship with Jesus should unlock you to live for the church. And we're gonna look at the details of what that means. I wanna pray for us, and we're gonna go into a time of communion. You guys know the word, root word of communion? Community. Community. We come together to remember our Christ. And so I'm gonna ask our elders to come up. They're gonna begin to um, pass out the elements. If you're here and you're a believer, Please join us in communion. This is not a closed communion church. Um, but we do ask, if you're here and you're not a believer, we would ask that you just let these elements pass by you. But that you would consider what it would mean to place your faith in Jesus for, to make you right with God. And if you're here and you're a believer and you have um, what I would call strife or enmity between you and another brother or another sister in Christ, the encouragement from Scripture was, would be that you let the elements pass by you until you're able to become right with your brother, become right with that other believer or that other sister. And so um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing a little bit of a song while the elders hand out the elements. Please wait um, for one another so we can take this together. Lord Jesus we pray now that as we are a community here at First Baptist, would you fill us with love for one another? And as we remember you, God, I pray that the love that you had for us would affect us in such a tangible and powerful way, God, that we couldn't help but love the brothers and the sisters around us and that we would go all in on your church the way that it should be. Oh, Father God, I pray for the day that we would be so impacted by you that we would be changed from the inside out. We pray that now in Jesus' name, amen.